Good evening, everybody. Are you happy to be back in the house of the living God? Come on, give him some praise. And I don't tell you that just because you're supposed to, but because I know you want to. Can I get my guitar on for me? Uh, sing some uh, songs from an awesome man of God. He's a modern day Johnny Cash. His name is Zach Williams. And he's got a, some good songs, and we do, uh, I think we do the first two singles that we ever had tonight. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. Same old boys, the same old lies. You try and you feel the same old holes inside. It's a better life. It's a better life. You got pain. He's a pain taker. You feel love. Savior, you got chains. He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of the in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life There's a better life You got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom Save them He's a prison shaking Savior You got chains to mind the Lord tonight. You know, I went and seen my family over the weekend, and I ran into a good friend of mine. Ooh, gosh, God's good. He is so 
so good. And this friend of mine, she was in bondage for over 14 years. Her life was a mess. Drugs had a great hold on her life and was robbing her soul. And I ran into her and I kept seeing this young lady where we were staying at the motel. She kept waving at me and smiling at me. And I said, I know her. And so I walked over and she's a manager at that motel now. How about that? And she began to tell me how God delivered her, and she's been sober for almost 14 years. And I needed her testimony. I needed that. Because you see, I had just came from witnessing to a family member who is in bondage to drugs. Bless her, Jesus. And I know God's going to deliver him. He is a chain breaker. He's a way maker. There's no addiction too hard for our God. He is able. We just have to believe it. Don't give up on them. I needed that. God said, you see there, you thought that she was gone. I'm telling you, God is able. He's faithful. And you know what she told me? There are some things in my life, Joy, that is still not where it needs to be. She said things that people's telling me that I'm never going to get back. But God promised me he would restore me and give everything back that the devil took from me. And she stands on his word and I agree with her. He is awesome. He's almighty. He's all powerful. And he still works miracles. He's the only thing that works, church. The only thing that works. I love him. Worship the Lord tonight. Come on, church. Oh, I will praise Him. He's worthy to be praised tonight. When He told you you're not good enough, when He told you you're not right, when He told you you're not strong enough, Put up a good fight When he told you you're not worthy When he told you you're not loved When he told you you're not beautiful That you'll never be enough Fear is liar Let your 
tonight we're not coming asking for anything God but we come seeking your face God knowing in your presence there's fullness of joy knowing in your presence there's restoration knowing in your presence there's healing and deliverance God so we come looking unto you the author and the finish of our faith. And God, we ask tonight, God, that your Holy Spirit would govern, God, this Bible study, God. Anoint the man of God, Lord, as he minister your word, God. Help us set aside the hectiness of today and everything that we may have faced, God. God, as we enter into your presence, God, Feed us your word, God. Meet every need in this house, God, according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, God. We thank you for what you're going to do in this place. God, we ask tonight that you would make this atmosphere conducive now to miracles, signs, and wonders, God. Knowing that we're living in the last days, God. God, touch hearts tonight, God. Let us minister a word of healing, God, to those that are lost, God, that they may come to know you in the realness of who you are. And we say, do it for your glory. For truly it's in the master's name of Jesus we pray. And the church said. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap. You can be seated tonight. Amen. Come on, man of God. How you doing, Pastor? Good to see you, my brother. Oh, you got the memo. Look at us. Look at us. Great minds think alike. Hallelujah. Our broadcast is available online with Facebook and YouTube, so please, please share. You're evangelizing when you do that. Amen? Uh, 
It might be mundane in some way. It might even be a little annoying to you. But come on. Hitting that share button is all you got to do, and you are sharing the gospel. You're an online evangelist. Amen. <laughs> there are plenty of ways to give. If you cannot attend, you can give on our website at cfcsandycross.com. There's a giving feature there. You can also give on our Share Faith app. The download instructions for Apple and Android are on our website and Facebook page, and you can also mail in your donation to Christian Fellowship Church, 7814 South NC Highway, 58 Elm City, North Carolina. Again, thank you for your faithfulness. You can give in person now by safely dropping your tithing offering in an usher's bucket at the back or by simply using your mobile device, and we thank you for giving. Amen. Any visitors tonight, please turn in your slips at the Connect Corner after service. We have a gift for you. Wednesday night fellowship meals have begun. Are y'all enjoying it? Amen. Praise God. Y'all getting to church before I am. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. But it's good to pull in and see a, a, a just about a full parking lot on Wednesday night. Amen. Uh, so please register each week at the Connect Corner, and we thank Karen Ezell and the hospitality team uh, for serving. Amen. Praise God. And congratulations to her and Carlos Bigler for being our Servants of the Month for March 2023. Okay, life groups are this Sunday. You can register for them and inquire about them at the Connect Corner. Most of them are service groups right now, people that are serving together. Uh, we do have a ladies one, um, and you can inquire about that one up there. And we do have uh, one at Redemption Place that welcomes all. And so uh, we would love for you to get involved in that if you can. The Kids Egg Hunt and More is Saturday, April 8th, 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And the Big Easter Sunday celebration is April 9th. Come on, somebody. What better place to be for Easter than in the house of the living God? Uh, the annual youth fundraiser golf tournament is Friday, April 14th at Wedgwood and Wilson. I thank everybody that has gotten involved and are selling tea signs. The teams are full. We can't, have, we can't hold any more teams, and that's a good thing. Amen? So we cannot hold any more teams, but we can sell all the tea signs you want. All right? Uh, let's see. Let's believe. How about this? Let's pray and believe for the biggest missions offering in CFC history on Sunday, April 30th. Start praying now. Stuff goes out of that account every month, but stuff's not coming in. And so we depend on these fifth Sunday offerings, don't we, Pastor Tim, to totally fund our missions, okay? And we want to keep on doing missions, so please help us. The 2023 Empowerment Conference is Sunday, May 7th through Wednesday, May 10th. I will have more information about that as it gets closer, but please write those dates down and plan to be with us. Amen. And water baptism is right after tonight's message. Am I right? Amen. We're still baptizing? Good. All right. I've got something here from Reverend Eddie. Public Bible reading, 1 Timothy 4, 13. Do not neglect the public reading of Scripture. All right. This is a public Bible reading that precedes the National Day of Prayer, preparing the way for spiritual warfare. Location right here at the church. Uh, there's, you can see a sign-up sheet. I guess that's already at the Connect Corner. For any questions, you can please contact Rose Lowry. Raise your hand, Sister Rose. Wave it around in the air like you just don't care. And Eddie Thomas. So I have announced that, all right, and everybody do that, and that is a way to. We need to declare the word of the Lord over our nation. Um, and I'll talk more about what happened in Nashville yesterday during the prayer time. But, uh, so don't let me forget that. I want to I I say something about that. But I want to pray. I want to kind of get this message uh, preached first and then, then come to that. But we're going to send an usher for the kids uh, because one of the kids is getting baptized. And so go ahead. You guys can be dismissed. We thank our fusion uh, leaders. We thank our King's kids, Junior King's kids. And we will send an usher for you to come back. The student that's being baptized, Pam, if he can go ahead and change before he comes back over here so he'll be ready to go. Amen. All right. How many is happy to be stuck with me in the Holy Spirit tonight? Are you enjoying this provocative, tough, difficult series? Amen. How many know that uh, the Word of God is joyful 
But not everything in the Word of God is going to be happy, right? And so with that said, let us turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We do have time for a, a word tonight. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for being here in the middle of the week. Thank our online audience too. And if you have a prayer request online, put it in the comment section. The rest of you can write it on cards. And we'll go over that as well. And we'll be calling out uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and the people in that community where the school shooting happened yesterday as well in prayer tonight. But we are in a new series. Y'all know what it's called? Satanic Subtlety, an indoctrination of our culture. Satanic Subtlety, an indoctrination of our culture. Things in our society, things in our culture have certainly escalated over the years towards evil. From misinformation and lying rhetoric that misleads and even brainwashes people to actually choose for the destruction of their own country. We're in a time like no other. Elected leaders desire to not only kill the unborn, but kill babies right after they're born. To small children being exposed to drag queen shows. And them screaming to the top of their lungs in courts. And cussing out anybody that disagrees with them. Yesterday, I saw a man dressed up as a woman shouting in a courtroom saying, we have the right to dance for children. We have the right to dance for children. Amen? Well, you can think you have the right all you want to, but I'm here to tell you right now, if you go to my grandson's school and you're a grown man and you wear a wig and you got thong underwear on and you're bending over dancing in front of my grandson, you're going to get the five-fold ministry from me. <laughs> and my deacons will bail me out. <laughs> Amen? I ain't playing, y'all. Come on, somebody. Amen? I'll pray for you. And you, you have a right to be wherever you want to be, but you don't have a right to be out in public pushing your agenda and pushing uh, that on our kids. Amen? I'm sick of it being shoved down our throats. Blatant Satan worship at the Grammys this past year, but that's all right. God responded with Holy Ghost revival at a college, and it broke <laughs> just a few days later. Amen? To those being called hate mongers if they speak up against kids being coerced into mutilating their bodies all in the name of transgenderism. Transgenderism. And we're called hate mongers. We're told we don't love people. We're not showing love. And I know there's ignorant people out there that have not shown the love of Jesus Christ to transgenders. They've not shown the love of Jesus Christ to homosexuals and bisexuals. I get that. But I'm here to tell you right now, if I tell you the truth in love, how can you accuse me of not loving you? If I'm telling you that you're wrong and you're on your way to hell for what you have refused to repent from, how in the world is that not showing love? Amen? Or, or is it showing love for you to just uh, pat them on the back and tell them they can live any way they want to and, and you can be this way and that way and still be saved? No. Amen. There's a difference when you decide to be saved and you choose to be saved. There's a difference. You pull away from the old things. You pull away from what God said was sin. Amen. Hallelujah. My goodness. Transgenderism, that, that's, that's a term, that's, that's subtle, and that's it's satanic subtlety. And the list goes on, and I'll just go ahead and address it now. The same devil that whispers in a person's ear and says, the way God made you is not good enough, you need to mutilate your body, you need to take medicine to change who you are, is the same devil that whispered in a transgender woman, and she is a woman, she's not a man, they're calling her a transgender man, it was a transgender woman that walked into that school yesterday, and it was an attack on Christianity, because it was a Christian school, and the devil in her is mad at God, Right? And she was on a suicide mission. But my heart goes out to the families 
of those precious children and those precious teachers. And Lord God, give the principal of that school a, that reward, her eternal reward right now because she walked straight to that shooter and said, you're not going to hurt these children. And she sacrificed her life to keep, so kids could have time to get out of there. They ought to build a statue of her in that town. Mm. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I'm not hateful if I call that out. Because it's a lie. It's a lie. We feel all kinds of things. We think all kinds of things. But you can't do everything you feel. And you can't do everything you think. And the list goes on and on, including now deadly fentanyl entering through our borders, killing so many unexpectedly. And the person over our borders is being grilled by the Congress right now, and he has no clue to what's going on. He has no clue to how the cartels work, how the cartels are marking people, and the color of their bracelet indicates how much money they still owe the cartel for getting them through the border. He has no clue. He's oblivious. He needs to resign and step down. He's incompetent. He has no clue what's going on. But if we speak up against it, then we're called racist. We're called racist. Amen? Is he, why aren't other preachers talking about this stuff? You're getting away from the gospel. You're getting away from the gospel. We have got to arm our people with the gospel, but we've got to inform our people all the satanic activity that's going on around them. Amen? No, I do not have time to watch the news all day. I don't have time to listen to watch YouTube all day. I, but I say, God, let what information you want to get to me, get to me in the time. You know my schedule. Amen. You know how much time I'm spending in the Word and how much I'm time I'm spending in administration. Let me get the information I need so I can help the people you've assigned to me. Amen? Because i got to get up every day and be able to look in the mirror and say, I'm handling what I need to handle in this little corner of Sandy Cross. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Christians not being informed and being asleep is the reason we're in this mess. Hallelujah. It's, that fentanyl is killing so many unexpectedly in... If we say close our borders, we're labeled racist. And we're said to have no compassion towards illegal immigrants. You name it, it's happening. With pornographic curses being at the fingertips of every living generation. Never has pornography been the disease and the plague that it is now. It used to be limited to the, the, the black uh, plastic packages up underneath Uncle so-and-so's truck seat, right? It ain't that no more. Anybody can access it anytime they want to. And all of a sudden, they are linked up with a satanic curse, and they're getting intimate with people who are in a curse. And that same perversion, that same filth, that same lewdness enters your mind and it'll destroy everything you know about intimacy. It'll affect the way you conduct yourself in a marriage. It'll it, it affects the way women think of themselves. It affects the way men think of women. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. It's at the fingertips of every living generation. And so many souls are contaminated so subtly. By the forces of Satan himself. Here we are, church. Here we are. But can I tell you, despite all that bad news, there's good news. And there's hope in Jesus Christ. And everything that everybody you know, that I have just announced that they're suffering from, Jesus Christ can heal the transgender. Jesus Christ, come on, he can deliver the homosexual. He can deliver the bisexual. Come on, somebody. He can deliver the person that's addicted to pornography. He can deliver them in the name of Jesus. He could save the president and deliver him. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. He can humble everybody that wants that seat back too. Amen. Come on, somebody. I want the next president to be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Is that too much to ask for, Pastor Tim? Hallelujah. Father, help us tonight as we declare your word. Lord God, and we just, we present your living word, these accounts, these stories, what you did in the lives of other people in the Bible. Lord God, you'll do the same thing for us. You'll protect us. You'll guide us. You'll let us go through some things so we can learn lessons. Lord God, you'll test us when we're stubborn. And you'll help us when we're hopeless. God, we praise you. We love you. You're our provider, our healer, our doctor, our lawyer, and our judge. You are everything. You, but most of all, you are our father. And you love us. And we thank you for loving us even when we were unlovable. Somebody give him praise. Give him praise and give him praise. Mm. All right. I'm not going to take long. I know we have some prayer requests and we've got the baptism to do. But let's declare the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. I got one, one focus point, an idled mind and an open window. An idled mind. The Bible says that the idle mind is a devil's playground. How many know you've got to keep your mind busy? You've got to keep your mind busy. Talked to a retired brother yesterday. He says, I've replaced half of my work shift that I used to work every day with the golf course. He said, I get all my yard work done and all my housework done in the morning, run errands for the wife. He said, I'm at the golf course every day at the same time. He said, and I'm worked out. He's going to play on my golf team, by the way. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he's good. But I got to thinking about it when I, when I left. I said, you know what? He doesn't want his mind to get idled. He wants to stay busy, right? One way to fight depression is to stay busy, right? Idleness, if you're not doing anything and you're just sitting around waiting for something to happen, something will happen. If you're just sitting around with nothing to do and nothing to occupy your time, your time won't be spent on the right things. Because the enemy sees an open target when he sees an idled mind. And we know that the, the, uh, the windows to the mind, the windows to the heart are the eyes. And so you've got to be careful to what you are opening the windows to your soul up to. Can we look at a familiar scripture tonight? This example of satanic subtlety found here in 2 Samuel chapter 11 concerning David's affair with Uriah's wife Bathsheba did start a very vicious cycle. And I know we did this in vicious cycles, but vicious cycles is kind of merging into satanic subtlety. But how many know we can go over the same account and get a totally different message? You can never dissect the Word of God enough. So we know that his, his affair with Bathsheba started a vicious cycle in his life. It did. Uh, so much more came from the fallout of that. The Bible says that God told him through the prophet, the sword will always be against your family as long as you live. But if we go back to why the enemy first tempted him concerning her, then what would almost seem as a subtle escalation resulting in her husband's coordinated fall on the battlefield we then see how subtle Satan's plan can be in releasing evil into our lives to cause us to do things so far away from our character. When you get off track with God and you get on track with the enemy, you will start to say, do, and think things that are so not you. So far away from who you are. We begin in verse 1. It says it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. And guess what? David was a king. So where was he supposed to be? He was supposed to be on the battlefield, right? That David sent Joab, that's his, his top general, and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem, meaning he was out of position, right? You've heard me declare that. You've heard Pastor Tim declare that. He was out of position. He was in a, a certain position as king, and the king was not where he was supposed to be, right? We 
have been called to be certain things in our careers, in ministry, in life. Many of you are parents, or you do this for a living, or you do that for a living, or you do this for the church, or that for the church. And there's places you're supposed to be, and then there's places you're not supposed to be. And even as a Christian, if you're not serving or doing anything in ministry, amen, as a man of God or a woman of God, there's places you ought to be. Right? How many believe that? I know that we're getting out there these days and self-pity has caused so many people to make so many lame excuses for themselves. But come on, when the church you're a member of is having a meeting and you only come once a month, what in the world kind of relationship with Jesus Christ is that? Amen? You're a man of God. You're a professed Christian. Hallelujah. But you can't stay out of the club. You can't stay out of the bar room. You can't stay out of another woman's bed. And you're a man of God? Come on, somebody. We've got to be where we're supposed to be as men and women of God. No matter what you've been called to. And there's only a couple of people in here that's been called to pastor. And I know where I'm supposed to be. He knows where he's supposed to be. He knows where he's supposed to be. Amen. But we all have a place we're supposed to be. Am I preaching too hard already? I don't mean to, but I get fired up for this stuff. He was out of position. Let me get that first teaching point, guys. Watch this. When, you're, when you are in the wrong place at the wrong time, you will encounter the wrong things for your life. I know that's plain talk, but it's right. When you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, you will encounter the wrong things for your life. Years ago, before I ever gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong folks. I didn't even want to be there. I was young. I was under peer pressure to drive somebody somewhere, and they were trying to buy crack cocaine. And I was just trying to get back home because I had a $49 Mike Tyson pay-per-view. And I was missing all the matches because I let myself get in the wrong place. At the wrong time. I was given a warning. And then we went back because money was missing. And when we went back that second time, the same police officer this time threw me on the hood of the car, put my hands behind my back. He said, you're going down for this one. I hadn't done nothing but be in the wrong with my little 19-year-old self. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I was like, Lord, I don't even want no crack. What in the world am I doing on this hood? Then all of a sudden, out of the smoke, come another police officer. And I'm telling you right now, God sent him. Because he told the police officer that had me on the hood. He said, that one right there is guilty. Let that one go. Let that one go. He's got some people here to pick him up, to take him back home. We've been, I believe their story. He don't want nothing to do with this. He didn't have to do that. I could have gone down. But a man come along and said, let him go can I just stop for a minute and praise God for that because it's been a while since I praised God for that that charge could have messed me up from getting jobs and all kinds of stuff hallelujah but I learned that night don't be at the wrong place at the wrong time because you'll encounter the wrong things for your life Hallelujah. And David was not where he was supposed to be, church. It happened in verse 2. One evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And the roof he saw, on the roof, from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? The wife. Somebody shout the wife. The wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of your soldiers that serves under you. 
One of your soldiers. Listen, it's understandable for a man to be intrigued at the sight of a beautiful woman. I know y'all don't want me to say that, but come on. We have told men too long something's wrong with them. Amen? You don't need to gawk. You don't need to lust. You don't need to fantasize. Amen? But there's, come on, if a man, he is made to see, hallelujah, and appreciate the beauty of a woman in the right way. Right? But and it's, and it's even under, understandable if you inquire about her, right? But the moment he found out she belonged to another man in holy matrimony. And let, I'm not even putting in the equation that David himself was married. But we know he committed polygamy. All right? So there was some issues there already. He didn't appreciate marriage like he should. David had let power go to his head, and he thought he could do anything. He should have drawn the line right then and there. That's what a man after God's own heart should have done. And guess what? We're no different from David. There are lines we cannot cross, church. Can I get my second uh, teaching point tonight? If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to draw boundaries in your life, then your life won't look like the life of one in covenant with the Lord. Let them write that down, Leon. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to draw boundaries in your life, what do you mean? The Holy Spirit tells a Christian, ah, uh, your own conviction in your flesh and in your mind ought to tell you something, right? But come on, then the Holy Spirit ought to not even have to kick in. But how many know he will if he needs to? You turn one time, you say, I don't need to be doing that. Turn the second time, the Holy Ghost is going to say, ah, you don't need to do that. You were right the first time. If we don't draw the boundaries in our life, there'll be no boundaries. And I've been saying a lot, look, if you don't have borders, you don't have a country. If you don't have boundaries, you're not in covenant with God. Mm. I originally wrote down, your life will not look like the life of a Christian. Either way. But a lot of people got a lot of different opinions on what a Christian's life ought to look like these days. There's so much corruption going on behind our pulpits. So many people have backed down and sold out for politics. You've got to have boundaries. Sin is still sin. It ain't changed. It's always been there. And if you want it more than you want God, what is saved about that? Verse 4, then David sent messengers and took her, took her now, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. She had had her menstrual cycle. We're all adults in here. That's why she was bathing. She was at the end of her menstrual cycle. She was cleaning herself up. She didn't know that somebody was going to be looking at her and gawking at her, and the, the king of Israel was going to be a peeping Tom, Right? And listen, he went full speed ahead with his lust, and we don't know to what degree of pressure he put on her. Can you let's let's think? I, I think of her right now, and my heart breaks. Her husband's away, fighting for the country. She's at home by herself. She's just come off her menstrual cycle. She don't feel good. She's She's been bleeding. She's, she's had all of her inner energy has just depleted from her. She's gotten herself cleaned up to what she thought was in private. She gets messengers come to her door and say, the king needs you. She's like, oh, what an honor. The king is calling on me? What does he need me to do? Oh, let me get myself ready. I want to serve my king just like anybody else. This is an honor and a privilege only to get her there. Lock the door behind her. And we don't know to what degree of pressure that he put her under. 
She was conflicted. What do I do? What do I This is the king. I have seen this man worship. I have seen this man dance before the Lord. This is God's righteous warrior. Why is he doing this to me? And it says in verse 5, the woman conceived. Meaning she got pregnant right then. So she sent and told David and said, I'm with child. Then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite, her husband, right? We know the story, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. And Joab the general sent Uriah the soldier, her husband, back to David the king. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. Small talk. And then David said to Uriah, go on down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not, did not, did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? What's wrong with you? What in the world's wrong with you? And Uriah said to David, the ark of the covenant and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord Joab, the general, and the servants of my Lord are encamped encamped in the open fields. They're sleeping on the ground. I'm a soldier too. And right now, I'm supposed to be sleeping on the ground. I know where I'm supposed to be. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lay with my wife? As you live, sir, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. David is just banging his head against the wall. How can I get this guy to go home, sleep with his wife, so that when he finds out she's pregnant, he'll just naturally think the baby is his. You see what sin will do? It'll cause you to sin more. You see what lying will do? In order to cover up one lie, you'll have to tell another. It's a vicious cycle. And this is in the life of a Christian. This is in the life of the man who came from the lineage of Samson and the lineage of Jesus Christ. The Messiah is attached to David. Most beloved man in the, all the Old Testament. David gives into the subtlety of Satan and goes as far as one can go, resulting in a pregnancy. He then pulls Uriah off the battlefield in hopes of getting him to go home and be with his wife so he would just naturally think the child is his. But what David underestimated was the honor and commitment Uriah had for being a soldier. The boundaries Uriah had in his life confronted the lack of boundaries that David had in his. Mm. What happens when the lack of conviction in somebody's life conflicts with the great conviction in somebody else's life? Amen? Somebody's got to back down. Somebody's got to humble themselves. Somebody's got to get the pride and the self-pity out of the way and say, you know what? I have been a selfish jerk. I need to humble myself. I have been running my mouth. I have been gossiping. I have been hating on folks. I have been judging people. I have been rebellious. Lord, forgive me and brother, forgive me. But no, did David stop there? No, he had one more trick up his sleeve. Watch this. Verse 13. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him. And he made him drunk. And at evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Even drunk, Uriah had more honor and conviction than David had. And when you're drunk, you can't even think straight. But there was something so powerful inside of him that says, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I don't quite know why my king wanted me to pull one with him I don't even know what he why is he being so nice to me but no I get over this hangover I'm going to get right back out there on that battlefield 
Even drunk, he had more honor and conviction than David. So then, verse 14, in the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab the general and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Uriah didn't even realize what he was holding in his hand. <laughs> David was so cocky and arrogant at this point. That's what sin will do to you. It'll make good Christian people. If they, get, if they just start to wallow and, and commit themselves to sin before too long, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh comes to the pride of life. And when you get the pride of life and you can't nobody tell you nothing, Everybody else has got the problem. Everybody else needs to get their mess together but you. He's got a letter in his hand that he's supposed to give Joab. Little does he know that letter is spelling out, planning, and setting up his own destruction. He's carrying the orders of his own destruction in his honorable, honest, genuine hand. How dare David? After all God had done for him. And he's going to treat this honorable man this way just to cover up his sin. Hallelujah. And verse 15 says, David had wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah. I wrote above that, set him up. Set up Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him. Meaning leave him as a vulnerable, open target surely to be killed that he may be struck down and die so it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew he knew there were valiant men he knew that he could not take on all those men by himself then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab some of the people of the servants of David Failed, meaning they died, and Uriah the Hittite died also. David went this far to hide his sin. King David tried one last time to get Uriah to go home and be with his wife. Even got him drunk on purpose, but it didn't work, so he had him removed. Satan's subtlety began to take over David to the point that people had become disposable to him. That's what happens when you don't handle power the way you should. And the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. Skip down to verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that, her, that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. You see, she did love her husband. And oh, the conflict she felt. The guilt she must have felt. I slept with the king. I'm pregnant. While my husband was out fighting for our country and now he has risked his life for our country and now he has died for our country. And here I am, knocked up by the king. I know that's worldly to say, but come on. It's truth. Because she was beating herself up for what the situation that somebody else of greater power and stature put her in. She was taken advantage of. She was used. She was the product of lust. And now she's lost her husband that she married, that she fell in love with, that she took the time to have a relationship with and get to know and had planned her whole life around this man. And now he's gone and she's not even had the chance to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I let myself get caught up with the king. She has no choice but to move on. Verse 27, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Bathsheba had no other option. Uriah, her husband, was now gone. And she probably never knew, listen, she probably never knew that King David set him up to be killed. Nevertheless, she was carrying the king's child and would try to move on with her life, but this child she carried would die not long after it was born, as prophesied through Nathan to David. Nathan the prophet, remember him? 
he comes at David. David's sitting all back in his throne chair. Your eyes gone. Mission accomplished. Affairs been covered up. He's taking her as one of his wives now. She's going to bear him a son. Nobody will think any different except for the close people that he sent after her. And they have to keep their mouths shut. They could get killed for stuff like that. But God will take the boldness of a real true prophet. And real true prophecy will declare the word of the Lord even if it risks their life. And Nathan the prophet approaches the king, and he begins to tell him a story. And David thinks that this is an eyewitness account of a wrongdoing that has just unfolded and just took place. He says, my king, I'm here to tell you that there was this lowly farmer, very poor. He had one little sheep that he did not use for livestock purposes. He was a pet of the family. The children would play with him and the, the sheep would lay at their feet at night and sit by the fire and the family loved that one little sheep. And up on the hill above the poor man was this rich man who had thousands and thousands of sheep for livestock purposes. This man was rich. He could have anything he wanted in the world and all of a sudden he has guests over and he wants to kill one of the sheep and roast them for dinner. But instead of picking out one of the multitudes that he has so richly been blessed with, he goes down and takes that one little lowly sheep from that poor farmer and kills that farmer and destroys that family. David gets up off of his throne and he says, who in the world could do something like that? You tell me who this man is and he will be punished. He will be killed. He will lose his life. You tell me who this man is and Nathan the prophet with the fire and the boldness of God looks at him and says, you're the man. You're the man. David could have had Nathan's head removed from his shoulders right then. But can I tell you, the man after God's own heart was still in there, despite how foolish he was acting. And no matter how far you may have gone, amen, there's still something inside you worth saving. Come on, somebody. You can come back from where you've been. You can come out. From how you've been acting, you may have wandered off and acted like a fool and no part of your life looks saved no more. But can I tell you, you can come back to the Lord. David humbled himself. He didn't have self-pity on himself. He didn't make excuses for his sin. He didn't blame everybody else. I had a bad childhood. I didn't get an Optimus Prime for Christmas. <laughs> That's from last week. I'm sorry. My daddy didn't spend enough time with me. He didn't take me fishing like he ought to. All the things. Come on, somebody. I'm just thinking of random things. But there's all kinds of excuses people make for the reason they do the things they did. And yes, people do have had some terrible things happen in their life. A lot of unfair things happen to people. But you still make the decision of whether or not when you get grown of what you're going to do with your life. Are you going to hurt somebody because they hurt you? You're going to violate somebody because somebody violated you. You're going to ravage someone's life and break their mind because somebody did that to you. No. Let the vicious cycle stop. Be a man or a woman of God. David was a man after God's own heart. He had no right to take this man's one and only wife. And then lied and covered it up and then had him killed. David had gone so far, and that's what sin will do to you. It'll take you so far. You won't even act right, look right, think right no more. He thought he had gotten away with it. How in the world can a man who used to lament and sing praises unto God as a child while God was helping him to defeat lions and bears and at only 13 years old he slings one stone at a nine foot giant and takes him down just like that. God was always with him. 
Amen. And some would say, well, he didn't deserve to be forgiven. Who does? <laughs> Satan slipped in so subtly into his life. At a time when he was successful. At a time when he was powerful. At a time when he says, I'm the king. This is my kingdom. This is my empire. This is my throne. I can have anything and anyone I want. Even a man of God can start to think this way. Amen. But God will let you fall from that high place that you set yourself. Amen. And he would. If he thought being on the run from Saul was bad, he would later be on the run from his own son. And just like he went and saw another man's wife bathing on the roof and he took her and laid with her, guess what his son did? Took his concubines and his wives and slept with them openly on the roof for all to see to humiliate his father. That was harsh, but guess what it was? That's the judgment of God. And we need to remember God is holy and God is loving and God is kind. But God is our judge. That's what my name means. God is my judge. You do not want to fall under the, the judgment of God. We've got grace. Hallelujah. We've got grace. But can I tell you, the judgment of God is coming. That's not going to pack this church. Because the churches that are packed out aren't saying that. The judgment of God is coming. I talked to one of my colleagues today. He, I trust him so much when it comes to end times. He said there's nothing left to happen but the rapture. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. I don't want to fall under the judgment of God. I don't care if I got a popular church. I want a powerful church. Amen. I want a church that's relevant, not stuck, relevant. People need to be getting baptized and saved on a regular basis. People need to be getting fed the Word of God on a regular basis. Amen. I want a church that's relevant. And I want a church that's ready. And we're not ready if we got heretics and false prophets behind the pulpits telling people what they want to hear. Mm. Hallelujah. Bathsheba had no other option. Uriah was gone and she probably never knew that the king set him up to be killed. Nevertheless, she was carrying the king's child and would try to move on with her life. But this child she carried would die not long after he was born and prophesied through the, uh, the Nathan the prophet. David would repent, though. He would repent unto God. We're never told he does anything else like this the rest of his life. He lamented in prayer unto God. He fasted and he wore sackcloth and ashes as was Jewish custom for mourning. But guess what? Once he knew that the baby had died, he had resolve in his heart and God would bless them with another child, and his name would be Solomon, the wisest king ever. And I thought about this today. They asked David after he found out this baby died. They said, why aren't you, because David got up off the floor. He quit fasting. He quit wearing sackcloth and ashes. He cleaned his face, and he ate a meal. He was hungry. They said, why aren't you fasting? The baby's dead. He said, I cannot bring the baby to be, back, to be with me, but I can one day go and be with my baby. You know how many mothers I've had to tell that to since I've been a preacher who lost her children? I've had to say the same thing that David said when we're standing there and I've gone to minister to them at the funeral parlor before the service and it's just us. And they're laying there in the casket and they're looking at their son who's overdosed on heroin. 
And I've had to wrap my arm around him. I said, you can't bring him back, but you can one day go and be where he is. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, David would pay a huge price for what he did. But nowhere do we ever see he fell for the satanic subtlety of the enemy ever again. He had to learn a hard, harsh, infuriating, tormentive lesson. But church, I'm here to tell you, it comes at you that way. That's the way the enemy approaches people. That's the way the enemy approaches Christians so subtly. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this. You're a man. You need this. You work hard. You put up with a lot of junk from everybody. Everybody's pulling at you left and right, running you here and there. You need to go blow off some steam. Can I tell you, you still, <laughs> you got to have boundaries. And we're getting too close to the end now to start acting like a fool now. Amen. I say this to everybody in this room. I say this to myself behind this pulpit and on this platform. And I say this to everybody online. Amen. If your life has gotten out of control in the last year or two and COVID made everything crazy. COVID made everything crazy. Bunch of folks backsliding when COVID hit. Can I tell you, it is time to rein it in. That was a rehearsal. Show God you're ready. Show God you don't need the old life. Show God that righteousness still matters. Show God that clarity of mind and spirit and heart and soul still matter. Show God that you don't want to defend and excuse your sin. You want to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ and that you're ready for the return of the Lord. Is anybody in this place ready for Jesus to come back? Whoa. As I close... David certainly allowed the subtlety of Satan to not only cause him to commit adultery, but compound the vicious sin cycle with murder in order to cover it up. So what began as subtle, what began as subtle, grew. And that's how it happens. Right? Gateways, windows. Nobody just comes right out the bat and becomes a prostitute. Nine times out of ten, they become a drug addict first. Nobody becomes a drug addict first before they smoke one joint or drink one alcoholic drink. It always starts out small and it explodes, right? It grows. Depression starts out with a broken heart. Or a missed opportunity. Or somebody failed you. But are you going to let it grow? Are you going to continue to commiserate and bond over brokenness? Or are you going to agree on spiritual growth? Amen? Come on, somebody. Don't look for people to commiserate with. Look for people that will hold you accountable. Look for people that will raise you up. Good God, you don't want to stay in that brokenness. You want to rise up with a breakthrough and be stronger than you've ever been before. Don't let the subtlety of Satan grow in your life. We cannot allow sin to grow in our lives. And it always will unless we come clean with God and end it. It's time for us to start looking in the mirror and saying, you're the man. You're the woman. Are you going to change or not? Did anybody get anything out of this little Bible study tonight? <laughs> Pastor Tim, what say you, brother? <laughs> you could go. You could go. I'm so wound up right now. I can't even think about what I'm supposed to do. Go ahead and bring the kids over. Uh, go ahead and put the, I tell you what, before we do that, we need you to pray. Well, actually, we do need you to put the cherry on top, then pray. Amen. I'm getting out of order here. But I want to say this, because I didn't say it publicly a while ago. Chuck Johnson, happy birthday. Mm. I love you, Chuck. And I must say, your mama told me it was your birthday. Those mamas don't ever forget. Amen. Hallelujah. Every year at my birthday, my mama calls me at 730 in the morning and tells me this is when you were born. Amen. 
Uh, so happy birthday, brother, and thank you for everything you do for me in the church. We love you, and God bless you. I want you to put the cherry on top on this message. Then I want you to pray uh, right here for these folks and anything they bring you. I'm going to go backstage. I'm going to get ready to baptize, and Sister Gladys will bring me the, those being baptized. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for giving me time to preach tonight. I'm glad I got that word off my chest. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, Pastor Tim. Amen. Tell us something. Well, I just want to go back and piggyback of what you was talking about because um, position, position. He brought out position. And I like how this chapter opens up because it says this was a time when kings went out to battle. And like he said, he got out of position. But if you go on up in the story, you'll find out that, um, see, David dealt with the spirit of rejection from his own family. And if you don't see this, you will miss what, where we're going. But when God exalted him, because he never dealt with it, guess what? That door was still open. See, we got to deal with the stuff that the enemy brings into our life because you don't never know when it's going to come back to bite you. Am I talking right? See, so when David got in a position, see, sometimes we get relaxed when God places us in a position. And so sometimes we tend to forget about the assignment. Everybody in here has an assignment from God. If you're a believer in Christ, I'm going to tell you, you got an assignment. But if you don't pursue that assignment which God has given us, sometimes we find ourselves out of position. And like he said, it's because of the subtleness of it. And he'll lull you right to sleep. What do we do? Um, I remember I used to love this passage because it always sent me to Psalms 51. David talks to the Lord and he makes this prayer about God restoring him. He said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because we always want the presence of the Lord in our life, directing us and guiding us. If you get off track, don't stay there. Go back to Jesus. See, we're so prone to run from Jesus instead of running to Jesus. If you get off track, run to Jesus. Can I say that again? If you get off track, run back to Jesus. There's grace and mercy in the presence of Jesus. There's healing in the presence of Jesus. All we'll ever need is in him. I remember a long time ago, I used to always pray, Lord, let me fall in love with your correction. Because sometimes we do miss it and we do blow it. But if I can fall in love with his correction, I can tell you we're going to be all right. Huh? Because we'll continue to progress and go forward in the things of God. And that's what God wants for his children. We can't stay babies. We got to grow up in the things of God. People are coming, y'all. I'm telling you. The world is coming to the church. Are we going to be in position and are we going to be ready when they come? Because God is going to put a word in our mouth for those that are lost, those that are hurting. Those that feel like nobody's on their side and they've been rejected for so long. God is looking for the believers to stand up now. Huh? And have a voice in the earth. He's paved in the way, so what are we going to do? Amen? We bless the Lord. Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Al Heath, Joe is um, your brother, okay, okay. Sister Denise's brother, um, he hasn't had surgery yet. He's at weight mid with growth blocking stomach from emptying into his intestine. We're going to definitely keep him in prayer. We're going to lift him up in prayer tonight. Sabrina Long, asking for prayer over 14-year-old daughter. She's staying in trouble and nothing is working. <laughs> Well, we know a man named Jesus that could turn her situation around. Can I tell y'all this? A lot of times it ain't what it looked like. The devil likes to make it appear to be worse than it is, but it ain't. Huh? She's just in the right place for her miracle. Huh? 
He promised us as believers that he'll save our whole household. And I believe him at his word. I'm foolish enough to believe what God say. (laughs) See, sometimes you got to get foolish. No matter how it sounds or how it looks, God, I believe you and I trust you. You said it and I believed it because I'm standing on this word. Also, we're going to lift up Cheryl Meadows, Fred's mother, has a blood clot on the brain. And also, we have some other prayer requests. Um, Chris Hackney, leukemia. Brian Hackney has vertigo. And we're going to lift all these names up. How many believe in the power of prayer? Amen. Come on and stretch your hand towards this way. (laughs) Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before your presence, God, with thanksgiving, praise, and honor, God. God, you heard every one of these requests, God. You know it even before it happened, God. But know, God, that you are God of healing, God, for you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord yeah. that healeth thee, God. And we come standing on your promises and your promise alone because you're a God that cannot lie and will not lie. God, you're the Alpha and Omega, God, and we're so thankful, God, that you said in your word that healing is the children's bread, God. Amen. So, God, we touch and agree right now, God, that these situations are turning around even now, God. Even like the Roman centurion, God, he said, just speak the word. You ain't even got to go, God. You can just speak the word, God. And healing will show up in their lives, God. Amen. And we decree healing right now in the name of Jesus, God. Yes. Over her brother that's at Wake Med, right? Touch him right now, God. Even when the doctors don't have an answer, God, you have an answer, God. Thank you, Lord. And, God, we're praying right now that you will move upon every one of these situations, God. For you decreed in your word that you make all things new, God. And we thank you right now for your healing power, God, resting upon their lives, God. And this young daughter, God, who seemed to be all over the place, God, we ask now, God, that not only will you save her, God, God, that you will give her a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, God, that will change her direction, God. And God, that she will give her life to you, God, and come to know you as her personal Savior. We thank you now, God, for restoration. We thank you for healing. We thank you for deliverance, God. Even those, God, that are dealing with drug addiction, God, bring them out, God, bring out, Jesus. as only you can. Yes, God. We thank you now, God, for everything that you're going to do in these situations. For truly, it's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. Hallelujah. And all the church said. Come on, church. And Hallelujah. So. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother. Chuck, come and get uh, Pastor Tim's mic as he makes his way up here, because I'm going to want you to hand that to those that will be praying. Amen. And get you to take it to them. Who do we have first tonight, Sister Gladys? Who do we have first? Who do we have first tonight? Stace, I believe today's your birthday. Hallelujah. What a great thing. to be baptized on his birthday, and so we know that it's a good time. Amen. Hallelujah. And so Chase has joined the youth group, and they're uh, recently being in the park and using the spot. We know that going down in this water tonight don't make him saved. That's right. But going down in this water tonight because he is saved. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, uh, Chuck, I'm going to get you to give this to Pam. Pam, I want you to get up and sprint all the way down the aisle, come right to the altar. Come on, up, 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 let's run, let's run, let's run. <laughs> the reason, Pam's one of our youth leaders, and I personally watched her minister to this young man yeah. before service last week, yeah. and it really touched my heart. And when I found out that he was going to be baptized, she was his advocate. She came to me, she said, Pastor, I know that you and Pastor Tim have decided to do baptisms once a month on the first Wednesday night of each month. But we've got a young man who's really enthusiastic right now. And we want to strike when the iron's hot with these kids, Come on. right? Amen. And so, how many know we'll, we'll do what we've got to do? Hallelujah. Thank you, God. All right. Hallelujah. All right. She humbly asked me, 
Can you make this exception? Absolutely. We'll do that. Amen. Amen. And so this is his birthday. I want to say this before she prays for you. How old are you? 17 years old. How old are you? When I was your age, I had a baby on the way. Okay? Don't do like I did. <laughs> be like I am now. Don't be like I was then. Come on, Pastor. But can I tell you, I don't even know you, but I'm proud of you. Because you're young, you are in a satanic field environment everywhere you go, except here. Amen? Yes. And I'm here to tell you right now, the enemy is so mad with you right now. Yes. He's so mad with you. Because you are not a part of his statistics. Yes. Because kids your age, they ain't supposed to be caring nothing about Jesus Christ in 2023. Come on. They're supposed to be doing all kinds of things that are anti-Christ uh -huh. inspired. But you have taken a mighty stand right now. And I want to let you know, Carlos, Jordan, Pam, me, Pastor Tim, we are here for you. Yes. We are praying for you. And we love you yes. already. All right? And now you're a part of our family. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. What? Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And when he comes back, you're going with him. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Sister Pam, would you pray over Chase Trimlin's baptism on his birthday? I'll be glad to. Go right ahead, sister. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night, Lord. We just thank you for giving us the opportunity to witness this outward devotion that he's showing on his birthday on top of it, Father. He's leaving the past behind, Lord, and he's coming after you. His name is Chase. You gave him that name for a reason. He is chasing you, Father. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you for everything that you're going to do with him, Lord. Lord, just just touch his heart, Lord. I pray that the fire rains down on him as he's going down and coming up out of this water, Lord. Just bless him in each and every way that you possibly can, Lord. And let him know that when he feels alone, he's not. You're always there with him. Lord, just give him direction and guidance, Lord. And may he always chase after you. We love him, Father. And we know you love him much more than we do. And it is in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. Chase, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I baptize you. Hallelujah. Give God a praise. There goes a God chaser. Somewhere down the road. My, my granddaddy was a page. Amen. So I'm baptizing a distant cousin tonight. Amen. How you doing? Doc Page is my granddaddy. Amen. All right. Well, thank y'all for being here tonight. We're proud of you. God bless you in this decision you have made. And we are proud of you. And anything you need, we're here for you. Yes. And the enemy is mad at you. Okay? Come on. Enemy is very mad at you because when we stay quiet and we make no declaration on, for God. Jesus Christ, it don't matter if we have Jesus bumper sticker. It don't matter if uh, Jesus culture is your favorite band. It don't matter if you even go to church. That's right. But as soon as you start saying something for Jesus, Come on. as soon as you start lifting hands and praising God, then that's when the enemy's coming after you. Now you say, Daniel, you ought not tell her that. But I want to warn her. Because a lot of people will get weighed down with the attacks early on and they give up. But can I tell you, you've got a whole church family. Whole church. Before you tonight, you've got an army that's got your back. That's right. Amen? That's right. That's right. And our altars are always open and we're here to pray for you and, and help you and guide you all along the way. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. 
Let's see, let's see. Who can I think of? Who can I? Would he, who, let's, uh, my mind's gone blank. I don't want to call on nobody that don't normally pray. So I will call on Joy Meadows to stand and pray for Tracy's baptism tonight. Go ahead and take her. Joy, you got to sprint down the aisle too. I'm so blessed right now. Woo, mercy. Let's give God another hand clap of praise for what he's doing. Praise the Lord. Sister, I love you. I don't know you, but I'm going to know you. You're my sister in Christ, and I'm proud of you. Are we proud of her? Praise the Lord. God, I just ask you right now, Lord, to bless my sister, Father. Thank you for her obedience tonight, Lord. Father, as she goes down in this water, Lord, she's coming up a new creation, Lord. Father, I thank you for the powerhouse she's going to be, God. I know there's going to be great things that you're going to use her to do for the kingdom, God. We are her church family, God, and we've got her back, Lord. But most importantly, you've got her back, Lord. We may let her down and not mean to, but you never will, Father. And when the enemy comes to her, Lord, and lies to her, Lord, because if he talks to her, he's lying to her. God, I just ask you, Lord, to help her to have discernment, Lord. Discernment is so important, God, and I know you're going to help my sister, Lord. She's going to be a powerhouse for you, God. We claim that tonight, Lord, and we look forward to what you're going to do in my sister's life. Bless her real good, Father. Guide her steps, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Can you hold your breath? Now squeeze your nose and hold your breath when I take you down. I'm going to put you all the way under, but I'm going to get you out immediately, and you're going to pull yourself up, okay? It's going to be all right. She's going to be all right, amen? Don't worry about a thing because I am a professional. Right, hallelujah. Here we go. Tracy, I baptize you in the name above all names. Yes. I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I baptize you. Hallelujah. Amen. You did it. Yeah. You did it. Come on. Wherever you go tonight or tomorrow, make sure you witness to people and tell them you witness baptism. That means new Christians have given their hearts to Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Take the heart of this message with you tonight. Share this service on Facebook. We're going to be back for Palm Sunday. This Sunday, we're taking communion. We love you. Drive careful. And let we gave the devil a big black eye tonight. Let's praise the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Play some music, Brother Leon. God bless y'all. Have a good night. Everybody, Pastor Daniel Parker here with Assistant Pastor Tim Hall thanking you for tuning in this week and watching this live stream broadcast. Or if you're watching it recorded later on, we thank you. We want you to share it with everybody that you can. Hit like. Tell us something in the comments if we're reaching you. And if you're in driving distance, we would love to have you right here at Christian Fellowship Church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Come early for coffee and fellowship, and then we're going to have some of the best praise and worship music you'll hear anywhere and series preaching straight from the Word of God. And then on Wednesday nights, we have our weekly Bible study at 7 p.m., and we got all kinds of things going on Sunday evenings, life groups, men's and ladies fellowship, as well as our all-new Kingdom Couples marriage ministry we love you we want you to to sow into the church be a part of the church come on we love you if you got saved today you accepted jesus christ into your heart then we want you to message us right here on our page and we will call and pray for you again thank you for tuning in today pastor tim what say you to the wonderful people out there that's tuned in today we pray if this message has reached you because we're all about kingdom vision amen come see us well, you, we got to seek just for you. We love you. We thank you. And just continue to keep your faith in God's unchanging hand. And we enjoyed you. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless.